Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us. I'm Allison Klein, and I'm a reporter for Education Week, where I cover technology and the future of work, which, as you can imagine, over these last few weeks has meant writing a lot about AI. <laughs> um, today's K-12 students have actually grown up in a world, right, where intelli artificial intelligence is helping their families decide what to buy at the grocery store, even though they don't realize that. Um, it helps scientists track the spread of diseases, um, and it even powers the photo filters that work on their social media apps. Um, but the technology, even though it was everywhere, it was largely invisible to them um, and a lot of their teachers until a new version of ChatGPT burst onto the scene late last year. Um, most of you guys know this, but just in case you don't, uh, ChatGPT um, can write an essay on Shakespeare, a detective novel, or probably an Ed Week style story on AI <laughs> uh, that sounds remarkably like something a human has labored over. Not that I'm worried about my job or anything. Uh, now there's a ton of talk about how AI will change everything in K-12 um, from how students learn to what they learn. Um, so obviously there's, with any new technology, there's gonna be positive potential for these change and just change and possible pitfalls. Um, with us to unpack those questions, we have a great panel of experts. Um, Pat Young Pradit is the Chief Academic Officer at Code.org. John Bailey is a non-resident senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. John Grant is in charge of the Ethics Education Program at Palantir. And Mary Snap is at Microsoft where she is in charge of special AI initiatives. So we were joking backstage that these folks are AI experts, but of course no one feels, right, like an AI expert these days. Um, and I wanna thank all of you for joining us. So it seems that no one can decide, right, whether AI is a good thing or a bad thing, to put it as simply as possible. So let's start from hearing from each of you about what you believe are the most exciting possibilities for AI in education, and what are the biggest potential problems? And I'll go right in order, starting with Pat. OK. Thank you, Allison. Sure. All right, so what's most exciting? Uh, I used to be a teacher. I taught for 13 years, uh, special education, science, computer science, middle and high school. Shout out to my former middle school teachers out there. Uh, <laughs> yep, yeah, you know. Um, <laughs> And speaking with my former teacher hat on, what I'm most excited about is the opportunity to save some time. Uh, uh, help with lesson planning, help with grading, help with giving feedback to students through things like AI uh, tutoring. Um, and uh, it's not just about saving time and giving me time to, I don't know, uh, have more coffee or something like that. <laughs> it's about what I can do with that time. So I'm really excited about being able to build more uh, students, uh, sorry, teachers and students being able to build deeper relationships with one another. Things that AI uh, can't do currently and probably will never be able to do. Uh, things that are truly human. And I believe that the proliferation of AI in schools will actually make education more human and will emphasize the value of human teachers uh, the same way COVID valued uh, <laughs> the, the value of human teachers. Um, I'm concerned and nervous about uh, students, uh, the erosion of academic integrity, which we're already seeing. Um, I'm concerned about uh, the loss of critical thinking skills due to the over-reliance on AI tools. And uh, I'm mostly concerned about education, us in this room and educators in the classroom and students and everyone else, being passive consumers in this whole AI race uh, instead of active participants in the discussion and, and participants in the design of these technologies and the use and the guidance of these technologies in classrooms. Mary? Well, uh, Pat, you are a hard act to follow, and I will try. <laughs> I, I was never a teacher, but uh, I have been at Microsoft over 30 years and spent most of the time as a lawyer and then in the philanthropies, leading our philanthropies group. So I've sort of lived through various eras of technology, uh, really starting with, the, frankly, the internet, the phone, and now this. And I think what we're seeing here is another significant inflection point 
unlike maybe we have seen in technology in 30 or so years, un, you know, that at something like as something like the beginning of the internet. So this is a really exciting time, and we're all going to have to learn to um, adapt, and we learn along with it. Um, it in that regard, my title is new as of about three weeks ago. Oh, congratulations. So um, we are all learning on the job. But what I would say broadly when I think about education is similar to actually what Pat said. Um, it is the ability to use technology for the benefit of people. And so when I think about that, it's for the benefit of teachers and for the benefit of students both. And I think some, similar to Pat, there is the ability to do some things if you're an instructor faster. And they may be the things that are not your most favorite thing to do. So for example, if you typically write a monthly newsletter about what the students are learning this month that can go home to the parents, that might be something you might use that, that chat bot to help you do a little bit faster. Now you're gonna wanna read it <laughs> before you send it out because we, we all know that you know it needs to be in your voice, it needs to be you, but it also could be wrong as we start out. So the tools get better and better and better as they're used. So efficiency is really good. I think also beneficial um, just for students and learning. Um, in preparation for this, I actually did call a teacher, uh, my niece. She, is, she teaches in Bixby, Oklahoma. She teaches third grade, and it's her second year teaching. Mm. And she said, I use AI all the time. I'm like, really? <laughs> Bixby, Oklahoma? Um, she goes, you'd be surprised at what happens in Bixby. <laughs> but she said, you know, my students read aloud, and we use an AI tool for them so that they, I can understand better how they're pronouncing words and how they're understanding words. It gives real-time feedback to the student. It's recorded. I can look at it later and then help the student one-on-one. -on -one. She said, I have a classroom of 35 kids. So this is incredibly helpful to me. So I think of those things are really good. What I'm worried about, given the true, you know, kind of Microsoft technology background, I am worried, and the philanthropy background, I am worried that the adoption will be uneven so that the inequities that we know already in, exist in education might get even more disparate. I think we can use this tool as an opportunity to bring that together to really help to reduce the inequities in education, to make AI tools, appropriate AI tools, accessible to everyone. Yeah, jumping off that, I, I think the thing that I'm most excited about is I think that AI is going to democratize technology in a way, right? That now, you know, some of us are some of us are mathematical people and engineers. I'm more of a poet. Uh, <laughs> I became a lawyer specifically not to do math, um, <clears throat> uh, and so you know it's difficult for me to interact with technology in ways. But now you're going to be able to actually use plain language to ask questions, uh, to write code, to say I want you to do this, this, and this, or tell me how this works. And the AI, the LLMs are going to be able to translate that into usable. Uh, code, right? Um, so it's going to empower students, everybody, to be able to uh, to make much more effective use of technology that otherwise would have been, you know, the reserve of the coders and the data scientists. Um, so that's very exciting. Um, the other edge of that sword, though, uh, is that it's going to democratize technology. Um, I'm reminded of the the Twitter engineer who uh, spirited the team that that created the retweet button, and he famously said, "I think we just gave a loaded weapon to four-year-olds." Um, <laughs> AI is a nuclear bomb, and the entire world has already got it, right? Uh, and so, you know, I'm not sure as a society we're ready to handle that very well. We need people to take in their own responsibility for how they use it, um, and that's a challenge for people right now. Great. It's always hard to go last. So, um, <laughs> so I, I'm so excited about this type of technology. I, in fact, I can't remember a time I've been more excited, and, and part of it is just the mystery that um, the companies that kind of release these capabilities and new uses are getting discovered, I mean, literally by the day. And, and the way to think, I think part of the reason I'm excited about this, particularly for education, is that a lot of times, like, the gateway drug into all this is, like, write a clever song, write an essay. But it does so much more than that. Uh, with literally four lines of text, you can turn it into an adaptive tutor on any subject, in any grade, uh, in any language, and also any interests. And so the, the demo I've been showing to people is John sixth grade fraction Star Wars and all the examples in Star Wars. But you can flip it to Taylor Swift songs, you can flip it to dogs, you can
can flip it to Pokemon, you can flip it to Ronald Reagan, and it'll just do Ronald Reagan uh, examples. <laughs> We've never had technology out of the box that can do something like that. Uh, I think about all the different ways. We've seen so many surveys from RAND to EdWeek that have talked about the, just the drudgery teachers are facing filling out paperwork, spending so much time planning. It's robbing them of the time spending with their, their kids in their class or their peers. This is the first time we might have productivity tools for teachers that can take away uh, some of that drudgery and some of those tedious tasks and free up their time. So I'm super excited about the, the, the chance to, to give a co-pilot uh, in, in the way Microsoft talks about this to teachers to help them uh, be better teachers to spend more time relationally with kids. Um, my concerns, a whole bunch of concerns. Actually, the, the nuclear um, metaphor is interesting. Sam Altman was just testifying a week ago and said we need a uh, regulatory agency, the equivalent uh, of the nuclear regulatory agency to sort of like regulate this technology. Now step back and think about that. Something he's saying is not nuclear, but something so powerful needs that type of regulatory agency, and now those capabilities are being <laughs> given to middle school teachers and to kids. That's an amazing sort of capability. We have to hold that tension in our head. So I worry about the regulatory issues. I worry these chatbots can be very personable. We're seeing a whole bunch of research coming out, especially in the medical side, where you can comp uh, compare a response from a chatbot to the human doctors. And patients and even other doctors are preferring the response from the chatbots. I worry this is going to exacerbate some of the loneliness epidemic that our Surgeon General and others have been talking about, especially in the teenage mental health crisis that we're facing right now. I worry about bias. And then I also worry about this other thing, that sometimes the fastest response that these systems can produce doesn't necessarily mean it's the best. So can it produce a lesson plan in less than 20 seconds? Yes. Is it the best lesson plan? Maybe not. And so it's so important for us to make sure humans are still in the loop and to make sure that teachers in particular are using their judgment to make sure it's not just the, the fastest and easiest type of lesson and activity, but it's the best that the kids deserve. Allison, could I just really quickly hop in um, to say that, John, I appreciate what you, you talked about a regulatory framework. I actually just bolted over this morning from a speech that Brad Smith, uh, my boss, Brad Smith, uh, the Microsoft president, gave this morning exactly about setting up a regulatory framework for artificial intelligence. So I'm sure you're going to be able to find it kind of very soon, yes. uh, various places. But, uh, but, I, but I really would, would um, would, would recommend that as the beginnings of that. That's not our topic today, but, but there's just a lot of information out there, um, even as of this morning, on the regulatory yeah. framework. Okay, thanks for, um, thanks for that breaking news. We appreciate that. <laughs> um, and um, I guess, segueing to education, um, you know, kids out there, new job, AI regulator. Um, so John, at Palantir, you actually have a really interesting job. You're responsible for educating your colleagues on AI ethics. So what do you see as the biggest ethical considerations for AI? And if you were that, if you were Mary's niece teaching in um, Bixby, Bixby, Oklahoma, um, how would you be preparing to, what, what should she be preparing to tackle ethically when it comes to AI? Uh, big question. Um, AI is at once everything new and nothing new under the sun, right? The, the, the classic, ethical questions that have plagued us with every new technology in history are still underlying here. It's just per new permutations of those questions. So things we talk about and things I talk about in my program are how do you apply va your values as an individual, as an organization, as a culture to identify what the ethical issues are with this particular technology? Um, how do you draw the boundaries of your uh, ethical responsibility, right? You can, you know, thankfully technology has moved beyond saying, well, we're just responsible for the code. If it works, it's not our problem how it's used. We've now started to say, okay, we are going to take responsibility for the effect we have on society, but in a complex interlinked society, how do you draw that boundary? What can and should you take responsibility for? Um, how do you generate trust, right? How do you make this technology trustworthy? How do you make yourself trustworthy? How do you decide what to trust? Uh, how do you treat people with dignity and respect, right? How do you make sure that human beings are not instrumentalities um, to an end, but that their well-being is the end in itself? Um, and then a big challenging question, especially for organizations operating on a global scale, how do you find the right median between moral relativism on the one hand, right? We'll do whatever you can do wherever you are, and you have sort of unmoored entirely from any, any principles that necessarily guide your entire organization. 
um, against paternal, ethnocentric paternalism, right? Well, only we know what's right and the whole world will do what we think is right. There's a balance there, right? Um, and so those are all immensely complicated ethical questions. Um, and so what I do at Palantir is I actually teach engineers, when I say teach engineers ethics, I'm talking about Aristotle and Kant and Bentham and Singer and Scanlon and teaching through pragmatic examples, teaching them how to come up with a framework for themselves to ask the question, is this the right thing to do or not? Um, and I'd love to see that happen in schools, uh, in high schools and yeah. things like that. I think it's a bit tricky um, uh, now, and particularly this current environment, to say, I'm going to teach ethics in schools. That's going to turn into, you're going to tell people what's right and wrong. And that's not what ethics is. Ethics is a framework for people to figure out what's right and wrong for themselves. So what I would teach students uh, is that they have power over technology. I think it's one of the things that shocks me, even talking to engineers coming to colleges who come and work at these places, is there's sort of this mentality that technology happens to us. We have no control over it. And, you know, oh, well, it's going to happen. This is just what's going to happen. And, you know, I guess we'll just have to deal with it. Um, we need to teach kids that, no, you, you make things happen. You have power. You get to say how something is used or not used. Um, you are not a victim of technology, um, but you are a controller of technology. Um, so, Mary, you have been spending a lot of time lately talking to educators across the country, I guess especially in Bixby, um, about <laughs> AI. Um, what are you hearing from them directly, um, and how is a company like Microsoft responding to what you're hearing from teachers? Well, it, it's a question where it's just so important to listen as, these, as all new technology comes about to listen. So not just me at Microsoft, but Allison Knox, who I've just noticed in the back of the room scooting in, uh, has been talking to a lot of educators, along with people in our AI policy team. So John, we've already set up a responsible AI group that's been in place now actually for seven years, thinking about some of those ethical issues. Hey, look, every day there are, there are more things to tackle and new ways to think about it. But, but that responsible AI team was part of the group that talked to educators. We included someone who is an expert from our accessibility division, which really helps to ensure that the products that we design can be accessible for people with all different kinds of abilities. We included Allison, who has been an expert in the field of education for 20 or 25 years. And to be honest with you, we heard many of the same things that have already been expressed right here on the stage. Um, we heard, I think, more than not, that teachers were open and wanted to explore the technology that they knew that the students would need to use the technology in their lives going forward, in the next grade or in the next three grades or in their careers. So the teachers, by and large, felt that it was really important that we would adopt the technology in a responsible way in the classrooms. So more open than you might think. Um, one of the really strong areas uh, of excitement for the technology was in the area of, of uh, working with students with special needs and with disabilities, because the technology can do so much to support those, uh, those students. So I think there was a lot of, more than just neutral, but excitement in, in, yeah. in that regard. People were worried about the things that, that John, the two Johns have expressed, mm -hmm. actually. And, and I think that those will be things that we will have to work to mitigate. But I think our goal is to, with that, to take the feedback, to help to design some of the Microsoft features and products in Teams, in Word, in PowerPoint, to help to mitigate some of those concerns. Knowing that those concerns around ethics and um, whether it's plagiarism or, or cheating, have always existed. And this does exacerbate it. John, I think you're right to say that, that this exacerbates it. But I think it's, it, the question is, how do we work to mitigate that? And you know, I, I think, John, this notion of thinking about ethics and responsibility is already true in our classrooms. And this will be another element for us to think through. But by and large, the reaction has been positive to the technology um, I'd say positive to saying, I, I actually talked to uh, another um, educator very recently, and she just kind of, honestly, she threw up her hands and said, you know, we're just going to have to deal with it, you know, just like Wikipedia, you know, <laughs> we're just going to have to figure it out, and we're going to figure it out, you know, and so it was this, you know, very positive and then a very pragmatic approach.
Yeah, no, I think that that's right. And, um, and I love what you said about uh, students in special education. Um, so John Bailey, our other John, um, the Walton Family Foundation um, recently released the first national survey of teacher and student atti towards attitudes towards chat GPT. Pretty sure Ed Week we did the second survey, at least on teacher at at um, attitudes. 51% um, of teachers have said they've already used ChatGPT. Um, what else do we know about the opinions of teachers, families, and students of this like brand new chatbot? Yeah, that was a survey uh, two months ago, which feels like an AI, like it's even longer than yeah. pandemic time. Yes. Like, that might as well yeah. been like 10 years ago. Uh, there's another study that just, a survey came out yesterday from Pew that looked at adults, mostly 18 and above. Not surprised, but I mean, what's interesting, about 56% of the public's heard about ChatGPT. Only 15% have used it, according to the, the Pew survey. Skewed heavy towards younger populations, 18 to 25. Uh, the Walton survey found that uh, teachers were much more open to this uh, than you would think. A lot of experimentation. I think the one challenge with so many of the surveys right now is that you know ChatGPT is one technology. Right, you know, right now, if you go to uh, to Bing, Microsoft Bing, and, and you're chatting with Bing, you're chatting with GPT, but you don't know that. Uh, if you're using Google Bard, it's another LLM. And there's um, there's one that was very popular with students that like is not showing up anywhere on a lot of uh, adult radars. It's called Cactus.ai, and Cactus.ai is like sort of a whole suite of tools around AI built for kids and for students. And, uh, and so it, I think part of the challenge here is that you're describing a general type of technology that people are experiencing with in kind of different ways. I, I think the uses are far higher, especially amongst kids. Kids are turning to it for homework, everything from searching for a result, writing essays. Um, some of the math capabilities have improved, so now students are experimenting with math capabilities a little bit as well. Um, and teachers, like, I don't think we have a great pulse yet on all the different ways that teachers are using it. I'd love to sort of see a national sort of like prompt library. Like, what are the prompts teachers are using? Like, what are the tasks they're asking these systems? That would tell us so much more than sort of a survey. So, um, but yeah, I think it's positive at, at this point. So uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see more data coming out shortly. I'm sure we will. <laughs> As you said, it's only been a few months, yeah. Um, so Pat, your organization um, and many others um, recently launched a new initiative um, between education and tech to create a framework basically for how to teach about AI but using AI, right? Um, so what was the impetus? Um, and what do you think are going to be the biggest challenges when it comes to teaching AI and then also about AI, AI literacy in the classroom? All right. Well, um, so the initiative is called Teach AI, and it is about teaching with AI, so crossing uh, any subject, but then also teaching about AI, so AI literacy, AI competencies. And it's chaired by five organizations, Code.org, ISTE, who's in the room right now, Richard and Joseph, um, Khan Academy, uh, ETS, the world's largest assessment organization, who's doing a lot around AI and assessment, uh, and the World Economic Forum. And it has uh, a number of prominent AI um, organizations and AI interested organizations and education organizations as part of the advisory committee. Some of them are in the room, so I want to give them a shout out. Folks like Microsoft, obviously, and then OpenAI uh, on the tech side, uh, but also in the, uh, I, I call it the category of alphabet soup organizations in the US uh, dedicated to education. So uh, CCSSO, uh, AASA, NASB, uh, et cetera. Um, so there are a number of organizations behind this. It's not just code.org. Um, and uh, what is it all about? It's about providing guidance to government leaders and education leaders around uh, areas such as standards, curriculum, pedagogy, professional learning, assessments, tools. And we all know this clamor around AI. That's why we're here on this panel right now. And uh, the same thing's happening in classrooms. And just like uh, uh, Mary's niece, Teachers are just trying to figure it out. Administrators are just like, what do we do? Does our current district tech policy apply to AI, or does it not? Should we just ban it, which obviously we know some districts are just doing. And, and then they unban it, and then they, uh, I'm, I'm referencing New York City. Yeah. Uh, and, and so you know, there's just a need for guidance. So the impetus is a need for guidance and uh, a response to that need for guidance. It's also, and this is particular to us in this crowd, it's a 
proactive opportunity to make the most of this window of opportunity to apply, uh, to really change what school is. And so there's the, you know, there's Wikipedia, there's the internet, and mobile phones, uh, Google search, et cetera, et cetera. And these things just happen to education. What we're trying to do with Teach AI is uh, not uh, uh, become, like help education and education leaders and policymakers be active participants in, in how AI is used in education. Um, and the challenges in the end are why we created Teach AI. Uh, the challenge is that it's just gonna be a wild west of people just implementing different things and some things might work, some things don't. Uh, there are gonna be uh, security and privacy issues that pop up and all this could be minimalized a bit if they just got some guidance from state education agencies, from organizations, from their LEAs and uh, and, and you know, lastly, TJI is not just a U.S. thing, it's a global thing. And so there are already 16 ministries of education from Belize to Uzbekistan. I couldn't figure out anything <laughs> alphabetically more than you and me. Uh, maybe there will be very soon. But yeah, 16 yeah. ministries of education that are involved in this. And so it's a global initiative. So it's a response not just to the needs in the U.S., but the needs internationally. All right. Um, we're looking forward to it. So, um, John and Mary, we're, we're in we, uh, not much time left to answer a big question, right? <laughs> so, um, so obviously, big technology comes with um, natural concerns about change and displacement. How are your companies and your industry thinking about ways to upskill the current workforce? And most interesting to me, although maybe not to everyone in our audience, what's your advice to K-12 educators um, and the K-12 sector about what they should be teaching students to succeed in the future workforce where AI is gonna play a really significant role. Do you want me to start? Please. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, let me just first start out by a big shout out to code.org that's been doing such amazing work in the area for 15 years now, close to 15 years Thank now. You. So, and the partnership has been wonderful. Thank so you. You, um, it's been great to see that organization grow. Um, in the area of skilling, I would say, as I was just listening to John Bailey speak earlier, there will be many new jobs with many new titles. So, for example, we are talking about uh, knowing that there will be a job title called a prompt engineer, someone who will know the right kinds of questions to ask to get the best and the most accurate answer that's closest to what you need, and that we will be skilling for that. But broadly, the answer to the question is, is just as we started scaling with computer science education seven or eight or ten years ago now, we really think it's important to provide skilling in the workforce with respect to artificial intelligence. We are working on curriculum now that will be available in the next few months on LinkedIn Learning and Microsoft Learn that we hope will get a way for people to get very comfortable with the technology, anybody you know, taking these certificates. And we believe that in the next two or three months, we'll be ready to launch a major initiative to talk about what sorts of skills will be needed uh, in a world where AI is much more prevalent. And so more to come on that. We're like, it's, it's being baked right now. Yeah. In the next few months, we'll, we'll be out. But we know that it is something that will be absolutely important to do. And for the next question, I know I'm just going to, you know, dovetail right into John, because I think that students are going to be using AI. I will bet you that the Walton Family Survey that was done two months ago, the number of teachers who have attempted it, you know, tried it, is is higher than it was. So I would say, first go out to the new Bing, you know, download, <laughs> go to the new Bing, and just and give it a shot, you know, just like give it a shot. Um, but I do think the importance, the ongoing importance of teaching ethics and responsibility and trust is, is a foundation for all of technology. And, and that you know, needs to be woven into the teaching of how to use AI. Yeah, 100% agree. I mean, it would be a broken record, but yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. Responsibility, right? You have to, you have to imbue in these, these students responsibility for what they're building and the effect on the world. And there's a dangerous tunnel vision sometimes with engineers and computer scientists where they say, hey, I've got to build this thing and it's going to work and it's going to be cool. One of the driving impetuses for when I started the education program at Palantir was a quote that I read once from Frank Oppenheimer, uh, Robert's brother, who was also an engineer on the Manhattan Project. And they asked him later in life, they said, how, you know, how do you feel about having worked on a genocide weapon, right? And, and you know, what were you thinking about when you, when you were doing that? 
And his response chilled me. He said, somehow we never thought it would be used on people. Um, wow. In the middle of the most violent, bloody war in history, right? Um, and I, I think, and again, I'm not disparaging Oppenheimer, I think, but I think that's, you know, I, he was solving a mechanical problem. He was solving an engineering problem. Um, and, you know, sort of the broader implications wasn't considering. And I think we've got to show all these engineers, all these students, it's not just the project in front of you, but you have to figure out how is it going to affect the world. Uh, and, and you have to say, am I happy with that or am I not happy with that? And how am I going to mitigate those negative effects? Um, so, yeah, we really just have to drive home. You are responsible for the world you create uh, with your technology and empower them to make decisions that shape that world in a positive way. I think there are so many examples in history where we, you know, think about that. I mean, we often with our engineers, I think you, you know, you are exactly right. You know, an, an engineer should learn history along the way. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about, you know, privacy issues in our products and our technology, we often, you know, talk to engineers about the history of World War II and the surveillance mechanisms that were used in World War II. You know, at that time, it was dogs who could sniff. Now we're talking about technology that can, you know, track presence and having that that context of history you know not just you know ethics but history mm -hmm. is just so important I think for people who are actually coding um, John and Pat I think we have a little bit of time for you to answer a similar question um, how do you see AI reshaping the skill sets um, required in future jobs and what steps should k-12 be taking to adapt First, John. Great. Uh, I love this question. Yeah. Um, uh, in part because I, we, we, we have some history actually to learn from. Like we've seen technology introduce, and y yes, it displaces some jobs, but it really changes more jobs and then it creates new jobs. So the spreadsheet did this. The spreadsheet reduced the need for bookkeepers, but it created more demand for financial analysis because what it did is sort of an empowered. Uh, a new type of work that uh, involves sort of more critical thinking and higher levels of skill. I sort of think that's what we're going to see here. You're already seeing it in the coding, um, uh, the coding sector, that uh, what you can do with these tools in terms of coding so increases productivity that it does a couple different things. It makes existing coders that much more productive, but it's also lowering the bar for what it means to be a coder. So I use ChatGPT to make an arcade game. Never done it. I don't know coding. I, I need to go to code.org. Code but like the fact that you could just have it and interact with it and it develop code and then put it onto a site and get something out of it, I mean, it just lowered the bar there. Um, I think we also have some data coming out from Burning Glass that has showed uh, the, the rise of hybrid jobs. So if you think about this, this was like a traditional domain, like marketing, married with some sort of technology skill, like technology, and then you get social media marketing. You get digital marketing. I think we're going to see a lot of jobs that have AI sort of now sort of built into it a little bit. I don't think you're going to lose your job to AI per se. I think you're going to lose your job to someone who's using AI a little bit more. The only other thing that I think is a little bit of a, uh, a warning here, though, is that usually when you have technology that's introduced into the workplace, where it's disruptive the most, the earliest, is usually at the lower skilled. This is the first time I've seen a technology really aimed at high-skilled uh, occupations. And so we're seeing this right now with radiology, uh, a lot of things that we're interpreting and just reading, different types of medical reports or imaging. AI systems can do much better, much faster, much more accurate. Uh, we're seeing this in the legal profession, that some of the things you would have a paralegal do or an entry-level worker do, these AI systems can do better and faster. And so I think those are the areas that we're going to start seeing this sort of eat away at some of the, the different tasks, not necessarily jobs. What should schools do? Everything you just served, they should sign up for code.org. Um, it's really important for students to start working with and using this. The ethical issues, wrestling with that, liberal, um, liberal arts sort of skills, super, super important. And then clarity on instructions. It's so hard to understand, like these prompts, are you giving it English language direction, but it, unless you're precise, you don't get the results you want. And so it, it's, a, it's a actually learning English and learning language construction in order to get the systems to do what they do. And so in some ways, this might actually help us with ELA and some of the other skills uh, inside of it, K-12. Yeah, and thanks, John. Um, I totally agree with the idea that every student should go to code.org. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, 
and the other things that you said as well. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I'm going to focus on the, uh, the latter half of that question, how education systems will adapt. And um, I'm going to go back to uh, something I said earlier on, because you know, I'm standing in a room of people who consider themselves people who want to change education for the better, whether you're technically an ed reformer or whatever. We all want to change education for the better uh, from our different uh, perspectives and vantage points and areas of influence. And uh, this whole AI thing is really exciting because it's not, you know, it's so, um, educators are really talking about it. Ed writers are talking about it. Administrators are talking about it. They're asking questions. They want to figure out things. They're not as passive as they were in uh, previous uh, tech inflections. I think that's super exciting. And so for you all, you really need to think, like, how can the thing, the innovation that I've been trying to push for so long, how can I use this window of opportunity to push this innovation? Um, because AI will open up doors. For example, uh, ETS and Carnegie uh, just announced uh, an initiative to broaden the way that they assess students beyond uh, the traditional way uh, that was more content-based and more summative and, and other things to something that's, that's not just about content, it's about skills, and not just about skills, like technical skills, but like even like behavioral or effective skills, which is really amazing. And a lot of that is going to be driven by AI and AI models. And so that's something that ETS and Carnegie have wanted to do for a while. But they're using this AI window and this AI tech to push that innovation. For those of us all the way at the teaching level who really want to focus more on like things like social emotional intelligence or like just building quality relationships with students and student mentoring and things like that, AI opens the door for that as well. So how will education systems adapt? Hopefully, they won't be passive consumers. They'll be thinking about like how do I use this opportunity to make a, a real change in education? And um, hopefully, I don't know, maybe a year from now, we won't be complaining about things like huge privacy or security issues or data issues with AI. We'll be praising like cool experiments that actually are showing like wide scale success because of AI. All right, so I, um, this technology issue, I am very nearsighted and having trouble seeing the clock in the back. Uh, do we have time for one more question or do we need to wrap Two minutes, up? it says. Two minutes, two thank minutes. you. Okay, two all right, minutes. in two minutes. Um, can someone, uh, this is open to all of you, and uh, this is a topic that we, what we brought up earlier. What are the implications um, for the federal government and policymakers? Do they have a role, right, in mitigating the risks of AI? Absolutely. And, all right, Mary, go ahead. Absolutely, yeah. and, and it's a lightning round, so I would just say absolutely yes. there is a role. I'd say, you know, we, we have to start with looking at the laws that we already have and applying those laws to AI, so privacy laws, for example, those other kinds of things, unconscious bias work that we're doing. We have to apply the work that fairness, the rules that we already have. And then there will be other areas, particularly with the very large models and, the, and databases that we will absolutely need federal and international norms on. And I, I will turn over the lightning round to anyone else. I, I totally agree. And my, <laughs> my, my twist on that would be like the how they're involved. And so with Teach AI, one thing in particular is that we're trying to translate policy into practice. This won't be about putting a PDF up on a website and say, hey, job done. You know, here's the summary report. This is about really like working the full vertical of the education system. That's why I named like CCSO and NASB, but then there's also like advocacy organizations, curriculum providers, teacher associations, et cetera. Because it's gonna take a full vertical to really figure out how to make how to again translate policy into practice. Dusting off my hat as a former Senate staffer, though, I have to say <laughs> you're going to have to create an organization that can keep up. I, the, yeah, the Senate, the, the House, the Senate, the courts, yeah. they don't move fast enough. And obviously, they play a role in setting out guidelines and sort of high-level stuff. But if you're going to keep up with AI and technology, you're going to have to come up with some sort of institution that can move quickly. Yeah, just a couple points since we're at time. The, um, one, I, I think policy needs to create an affirmative vision for what we want this technology to do in interacting society, not just minimizing the harms. I worry a little bit we've fallen into, in education we would call this a deficit mindset. We're so focused on the negatives that we haven't really given 
a little bit more of an affirmative vision of all the different ways we want this technology to improve society. So there's that. I definitely think we need um, a, a more robust policy apparatus that can keep up with the technology, whether that's a new agency or empowering the existing regulatory schemes, super, super important. But also it needs to be risk-based. Uh, and that, I think we have a NIST AI framework that is like a lot of people are coalescing around. That seems really smart. But it feels like there should be a different regulatory approach to if an AI decision is evaluating a student's uh, uh, essay and their scores in their high school and recommending if they should be admitted to college, mm -hmm. that feels very different than a teacher using it for a lesson plan. Yes. And again, I think we're going to have a lot of different AI uses for drug discovery, for autonomous driving. Like, those all have different risks, and we need a risk-based framework that can apply the right type of uh, regulatory scheme uh, at the right moment. Um, and with that, I want to thank all of you so much for, for your um, participation and thank our audience.